It's now 10.25 in the morning of January 20th, 1986, and um, I'm with Mr. and Mrs. Simons in room 866, <coughs> Ann Boutwell's room at the Hilton in San Francisco. Uh, my name is Herb Maybank, uh, newest member of the Historical Committee, and this interview is to be with Mr. Edward Simons, consulting engineer, and um, I'll bounce some questions off you, and uh, I was amused at this uh, first question of, of Anne's because uh, we'll find out in a minute, but I don't think you were very old. Anne has asked me to uh, find out what San, Francisco, what San Francisco was like when you were growing up, and she asks, do you remember the great earthquake of 1906? Um, so the first question I would ask is, uh, you were born in San Francisco? Yes. Uh, and what year was that? 1903. So at the time of the earthquake you'd be three years old and... Uh, Not quite at the time of the earthquake, uh, I was two plus. And uh, there likely isn't any recollection in a person's... or maybe I shouldn't say there isn't. Is there any recollection of that thing at all? Yes. Uh, it is my earliest recollection, and on the morning of the earthquake, I was in a bed with my in the bedroom with my mother and father, and they were sitting up in bed. And my father said, "There has been an earthquake." Isn't that amazing? I remember also somewhat. Uh, flashes of the cooking in the streets that was necessary at that time. But um, since I was born at the end of 1903, why you almost have to reckon me as 1904. Then in your growing up years in San Francisco, especially in the, uh, the early childhood years, you would likely uh, have some re recollections of the reconstruction and so on, the damage that... Uh yes, uh, growing up as a child we more or less took the damage for granted, that is I did, and uh, the building of the city around us uh, kept developing and we saw that develop so that was one of the things that was important in our lives was to see the city being reconstructed uh, in its eastern part. In your, uh, uh, you then would have started to school sometime but around the age of five or six? I started when I was six. And uh, I, I guess. Here and of course you... Yes. Yeah. Um, and your schooling in San Francisco, uh, grade school, high school? Yes, I started in the, in the Douglas School, uh, where we had lived at the time of the earthquake, but had moved from there, and then I continued on in the Grattan School, and then from there to Lowell High School, uh, and from Lowell High School to the University of California, Berkeley, where I graduated in 1925. And that was a degree in? Civil Engineering. Bachelor of Science in Civil yeah. Engineering? Yes, Bachelor I of Science in Civil Engineering. I see. Um, <coughs> and when you came out of university, uh, would you like to give me some background of, of your uh, jobs and so on, positions you held, or who you went to work for, uh, like say this, the beginning years, to kind of get a handle on how your experience, work experience in the early years contributed to some of the outstanding things you did later? When I graduated, I went to work for the Dinwiddie Construction Company. Dinwiddie? Dinwiddie. How would you spell that? D-I-N-W-I-D-D-I-E, I expect. You can check it. <laughs> and um, that was on the Central Bank building at 14th and Broadway in Oakland. Uh, and on that particular job, I uh, had the technical work of laying out the foundations and the um, running the lines and levels. 
from that point I left them and went with a steel erecting firm to um, a, attain a knowledge of steel construction. After that I worked for an architectural firm uh, and then did some surveying on my own. I then worked for the um, Emporium, which opened a large store on Market Street as an experimental store to see if they could move the Emporium from its present location, where it still is, out to Aiton Market. And on that work I did the engineering of the remodeling of the buildings and uh, the uh, layout of the uh, news. And uh, from there I went on to the Russ building uh, with Dinwiddie again and there I laid out all of lines and levels uh, to the top of the building and from there I moved to a company known as the Redwood Manufacturers Company uh, which uh, fabricated uh, specialty devices and equipment uh, from Redwood I see. How, um, how, many, how many years uh, after graduation would have been uh, spent in those various uh, civil engineering type jobs? About two and a half years. About two and a half. Yeah. And the, um, so the Redwood Manufacturing Company then... Um, it, it, it's manufacturers. Manufacturers, yeah, yeah. sorry. Uh, I'll let you carry right on then uh, because that's one of the things that um, she wants. Yep. Uh, okay. We can start right there, and um, uh, Ted, you want to just mention about um, uh, who you finished working with before you went to the Redwood Manufacturers? Yes, I. That was uh, with Dinwiddie Construction Company again, on the Russ Building in San Francisco, which was, I believe, the large highest building constructed in San Francisco at that time. There is some debate on that, but I think that's right. Okay, can I stop you there? No, we're back recording and uh, the little machine here, the needle seems to be okay. So you then went to work for the Redwood Manufacturers, which would like to be uh, early 1928. 1927. 1927. Okay, would you like to carry on and, and uh, tell me about your work at uh, Redwood? Uh, I believe that you were into some test towers or something like that, according to our detective Ann. Uh, I was first employed by Redwood Manufacturers Company as a hydraulic engineer uh, for the uh, construction and engineering of wood stave pipe. This uh, employed in the construction the highest grades of redwood lumber and was built in sizes from about four inches up to 16 feet in diameter. I continued in that work uh, for several years and then it was decided that the company wanted to move the uh, lower grades slightly below the clears into the construction of cooling towers and into the cooling tower market and I was assigned that job. With that I got into the study of not only the construction and fabrication but also the sizing of the water cooling towers uh, for heat transfer. Uh, this, of course, uh, uh, led to interest in the refrigeration industry and other industries employing heat rejection. And there's a very good friend of mine who once said, if you want to get into the board of directors room, come to get on the water stream. So I was getting all of this introduction then in the years when air conditioning, for instance, was quite new and when uh, many uh, portions of the refrigeration industry was quite antique.
From there on, it was a natural development to uh, do more and more of that type of work. And when I left that company in 1944, I went into my own practice and have continued on in that particular field and fields related to it, employing not only the uh, heat transfer but also uh, the techniques of uh, construction at low temperature uh, operation and control environmental conditions. Um, can I back you up for a minute? When you were at Redwood, you were there from 1927, then you stayed till 1944. Yes. Um, and uh, so you became involved in the uh, in the cooling towers. Uh, were there any uh, patents or anything of that nature having to do with cooling tower construction using the uh, the redwood lumber? Or well, there were patents uh, at that time when I was working. Uh, as an employee of the Redwood Manufacturers Company, and there were also later patents which I uh, received after having left that company. Mm -hmm. I see. Um, and were cooling towers used, uh, were the early uses of these cooling towers in air conditioning, or uh, were they mainly in more to do with process work? They were uh, related with both phases. With both phases. Uh, both phases were requiring water cooling towers at that time, mostly of the atmospheric type when I started. Mm -hmm. uh, but when I got further into it, of course, the mechanical draft cooling towers, um, either by forced or induced draft, mm -hmm. uh, had come into the field, and the uh, atmospheric type of free convection tower uh, dropped off there. Oh, yeah. Well, that, that's understandable, because they'd have to have so much more volume and space and so on, would they not as compared to our mechanical draft types? Well, I would say maybe I take a little exception to that. If you look at what is being done right now in many of these high towers, um, of the uh, well, several feet, hundred feet high mm -hmm. now, but operating as chimneys, uh, you see they could, they use draft, mm -hmm. and that was done early in the very early days also. I see. These but, towers that, uh, but, uh, were fairly high then. Oh yeah, but not like they're building today. Oh no. But if it is possible to get into a tower where you have enough space, uh, then you can well consider the use of the uh, atmospheric type of tower. Of course, it's energy conserving it's too, isn't it? And we are at this time uh, considering some of that f uh, to go with geothermal work up in Klamath Falls area. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, let's carry on to a. Um, uh, Anne mentions that I believe you presented a. She said a paper was presented on this. She mentions. Inventor, you were inventor and designer of a test tower with, and I had not run across this word. I asked her, and she didn't know. O V A T, cooling. Oh, that's atmospheric. No, the O V A T uh, Is that that cooling mean? surface was a streamlined uh, surface that offered very little resistance to airflow in the passage through a tower, uh, and that was for a mechanical draft type of tower. To be truthful with you, I hadn't seen that word before. I had not seen it until the patent office assigned the name to it, oh. or the description. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I once talked to a chap up in the vineyard area where you're going, and he was an Italian, and he says, oh yes, ova, egg, egg, yes, I see it now. But it was a streamlined, rounded nose, I tapering see. tail. Um, Airform. I see. And so they, they coined the name or found the name uh, or used the name OVAT because um, you know, most of these things over a period of years you, you've run across the words. And um, uh, she was mentioning that a paper was presented on this project at the ASME's 1939 semi semiannual meeting here in San Francisco. Would you have presented that paper at that time? or? I do not believe that's correct. I see. I um, became a member of uh, 
ASHVE in 1938, I believe, and of ASRE in 1939. And I do not recall a paper presented by me at that time on that. I see. She mentioned, ASM, had, uh, mentioned ASME, which... Uh, no, I did not... Uh, okay. I did not uh, present a paper here on that. I do not believe. Okay. Um, those... I have written numerous papers on it. Mm-hmm but not for presentation at a meeting. I see. Um, okay. Some of those early cooling tower projects, would any of them still be in existence? Oh, boy. Carrying on, uh, would any of those early cooling towers uh, still be in existence? I doubt that very much. They wouldn't have... Uh, that would be a, an absolutely fantastic life, I would imagine. Um, no. On your cooling tower work, uh, were they used only in the U.S., or was there export business in other parts of the world for those? There was some export with them, yes, and uh, but principally in the United States, some in the Philippines, some in the Persian Gulf. I see. Um, okay, carrying on from the uh, redwood manufacturers and so on, uh, Anne has mentioned here that uh, you invented the streamline vertical louver, and um, is that related to the dual jet principle? Are those two something, the two separate items? They were not related uh, at the time because they did not exist at that time, but the principles upon which they were based did exist. I see. Um, when the when the streamlined vertical louver, is this a, a, a tower item then? That was a, an item for an atmospheric type free convection cooling tower uh, to reduce wind driftage with a streamlined elements in the grillage that formed the louvers. I see. Um, when I was talking to uh, uh, Ed Jr. this morning, uh, he mentioned to me the um, the dual jet principle, multiple air curtain, and I believe uh, he mentioned that was being used in supermarkets, frozen food counters. Was that something uh, that was a, uh, an area of invention uh, by yourself? Yes. Would you like to give me some story on that? Yes. Uh, the <coughs> dual jet system comprised a vertical supermarket case which uh, put all of the displayed product in display, in full display, on horizontal shelves. And uh, a refrigerated current of air was moved around the construction and then discharged across the face as a refrigerated jet and it was accompanied in that discharge across the face mm -hmm. by a non-refrigerated jet or jets which acted as moving insulation mm -hmm. uh, to protect the refrigerated jet. The first was built with two jets, and that's why the name dual jet was given to it. Mm -hmm. And that st uh, stemmed from a suggestion by Dr. Deal, who was a member of uh, ASRE, when at one of the meetings in S uh, Seattle, I I believe it was, yes, in Seattle. Uh, he suggested that there be something done uh, similar to that which I had worked upon uh, for the Alford refrig uh, refrigerated warehouses in uh, Dallas, Texas. Now, 
the principle was entirely different, but it had air moving, so Dr. Deal felt it must have something that could be done. What time uh, frame would that be in? Uh, that was around 1954-55 because the uh, patents, uh, the patent was granted in 50, uh, 56. And uh, that involved non-entraining jets of air, whereas the other point w or design that uh, Dr. Deal had referred to involved actually the entrainment of air to pump it through frozen pack or w pack that was being frozen. Mm -hmm. yeah, and this was to reject uh, uh, the entrainment of the air. Mm -hmm. I see. But is that why it's called a multiple air curtain, then I take it? That's why it's called, yes, that's why it's called multiple air curtain, because there's a refrigerated primary jet, and then there is one or more secondary jets, which act as moving insulations, mm -hmm. but are not taking the... Uh, they're not in training with local air. They're not, they're not taking anything that passes through them back to the cooling system. I see. Which, of course, gives your cooling system better life. Yeah, yes, it uh, greatly reduces the infiltration against what would be in an open front itself mm -hmm. without that. That's mm -hmm. used all over the world. I see. Um, that's, uh, I'm getting a real education this morning, I must tell you. Um, but may I say this, that at that time Dr. Deal told me that the frozen food industry was at a standstill because they could not display properly, because everything was buried in the reach down or, as they called it, coffin type of uh, refrigerated cases. Mm -hmm. And this was the hope that something could be done that would put the product up in front of the housewife. The result was that about two and a half times the amount mm. of product could be displayed in the same square foot footage of or footage of uh, the in floor the space. Mm -hmm. Yes. I'd like to say that for a housewife in the grocery store, those dual jets you can walk down the aisles and you don't freeze to death. Whereas with an open front or the freezer type with cold airs coming in, you reach through that curtain of air, the warmer air, you reach in, you pick up your product, and you're never cold. You where don't freeze to death. In many cases today, you... Today, and even where you have to slide the doors open, you get that blast of cold air. That's right. Where you didn't, you don't with the jet. I imagine that the fact of where you get that freezing to death feeling is that people don't want to spend the money to do the job properly. That's right. That's right. Or they're using antiquated boxes, they're using anything but the dual jet, uh, and you, I know my store, you don't go in there without a coat on, even on the hot day, because all their cases are open. It's an old-fashioned store run by a Chinese family, mm -hmm. and uh, they don't change, but their prices are good, and the whole county shops there, but it's colder than anything. You don't go in there at all without at least a sweater. What a, what a fantastic thing it must have been, and as we've seen over the years for the frozen food industry, because uh, it's hard to imagine the frozen in industry, frozen food industry standing still, and then the way it has simply taken off, and it, it, but it must have been a, fa well, it's obviously been a fantastic improvement for marketing. Yes. Um, one thing I maybe didn't catch, and I should have, I'll just back up if we can, to um, redwood bark fiber insulation. Was that tied in at all to your times with redwood manufacturers, or did that come later when we get into uh, refrigerated warehouses and so on? Uh, that was somewhat in the uh, time of my employment by redwood manufacturers, but principally afterward. Uh, the principal developer of that was the Pacific Lumber Company, and they retained me when I was in my private practice, my own private practice, to uh, actually 
study their product of redwood bark, bark, bark fiber and its application and its in-place conditions of operation uh, in, in uh, field service, actual service, rather than that which would be determined by laboratory methods. And the redwood bark fiber then was a loose fill which is no longer manufactured, but it was an excellent film material. I see. Um, I believe there was something on its properties and application then published uh, in 1951 in Refrigerating Engineering. Would that have been one of the things that you would have uh, published? Yes. Yes. Um, okay, I'd like to move on to... Probably more important than even than that was later papers in uh, 54 and 55, I believe, which dealt with in-place tests uh, with heat meters. And that is where a new concept was uh, developed pretty well of in-place testing to determine the actual heat flow on a refrigerated construction in place, real life. Yeah, in other words, uh, not just a uh, laboratory test type of thing. No, in-place in testing. Mm -hmm. um, that brings me to really the, the next area that I understand that you were uh, deeply involved in, and I can imagine from what you said about your civil engineering work and foundations, and uh, I think all of us all of us as engineers have had our times of surveying, and that gets into uh, refrigerated warehouses, insulations, and vapor barriers, and the multiplicity of problems, and I think some real horror stories uh, over a great many years. So uh, uh, I'd like you to... Uh, expound for a little while on the refrigerated warehouses, insulations, and vapor barriers, particularly for maybe developments you came up with, and I think this, like your in-place testing, uh, I can appreciate that many of these things were, and I, I can imagine what a thrill it is to have, uh, and who knows where some of these uh, ideas come from out of our, our wonderful uh, gray matter. So uh, take a run at uh, refrigerated warehouses and uh, because I've seen some horror stories myself, uh, and uh, I don't think I've ever had occasion to talk to anybody who was as deeply involved in it as you are. Well, a great deal of my work today, and I'm still uh, very active in practice, is with insulation, uh, with vapor barriers, and uh, with uh, refrigerated uh, construction involving insulation and vapor barriers. And I have worked in the development of various vapor barriers. I have worked a great deal in the field of reflective insulation uh, for over 30 years, uh, employing reflective sheets in there and uh, spaces somewhat as a Dewar flask, but uh, without the evacuation of the mm -hmm. vacuum bottle. Mm -hmm. Uh, I have worked both in the design of it uh, and construction of it and uh, in the law courts in it. And there has been development along the line, of course, to make it less expensive. The foams made a big change. Uh, the, end, the end of cork made a big change. and. It seems that in these uh, things of which we are talking, there are cycles where there are, is great interest taken in a certain matter, and you must have vapor barriers, and you must do this, and it, it must, you must not have this, and it should have that. Have a vapor barrier, put it on the right side of the construction, and so forth. And other things go the same way, you know, with defrosts and so forth and so on. Then this caution is forgotten in many cases. And we build up to another crisis again, and it is rediscovered. And the wheel is then reinvented. 
and I've been busy reinventing the wheel, many things. <laughs> the cold wheel, I guess you could call it, eh? Well, it's, there's a lot of su fundamental facts, and you know in the very early days of refrigeration, the vapor barriers were placed on the wrong side many times. And uh, I think that one of the finest things that has been done by uh, ASHRAE is the work that it has kept developing in um, its fundamental handbooks on this matter. It has kept growing with it and its work has been excellent on it and I use it continually as a reference in addition to my own experience. And of course, because ASHRAE are publishing this in their handbooks. I'd like to add one little point there. On refrigerated uh, warehouses and so on? Yes. Uh, you, you mentioned the, the, um, what we've gotten in, in ASHRAE, which is very helpful, and ASHVE before it and ASHAE before it. And ASRE too, I would trust. Oh, and ASRE. But uh, one of the most difficult tasks I ever faced was uh, in South America when I was engaged to start up a refrigeration uh, industry uh, throughout Chile. And I was uh, retained by the Chilean government to develop refrigeration for their fruit industries uh, and for shipment and for fumigation and all of these things that go with it. And uh, this I consulted on for some ten years and made uh, numerous uh, trips into Chile. And I had to work with what they had as local uh, product. And this was very interesting because you have to be pretty inventive. Mm -hmm. And use things in a way that you never used them before. You had to be flexible. Yeah. So I never hesitated to use anything that we could, provided it was structurally sound and it was uh, technically sound. I would imagine, uh, with your long experience in refrigerated warehouses and uh, insulations and vapor barriers, that uh, you found the or discovered or worked out the necessary methods for preventing uh, the frozen floors and the collapsing ceilings that uh, where the uh, moisture went up and uh, I've had occasion myself in the last few years to see both of those uh, things happen in a place where somebody who didn't know what they were doing uh, built the thing. Yes, I do not believe that the floor matter has been totally solved academically. And I think the literature will show that, but there's lots more information than there was in it. At one time, ASRE had a uh, study uh, to be done on this floor heaving, but that study was completed to a certain extent and not carried further, as I recall. And there are records all over that aren't talked about in very loud tones because people don't want to talk about them, but there are many places where the floors have risen two feet in freezers and the structure has been destroyed. But uh, they don't want to talk about it because of the embarrassment? Right. And the pro maybe uh, costs. The, the costs to, uh, to fix. Uh, I would imagine also that this was a great tie-in for your civil engineering training and experience when you got into these refrigerated warehouses that uh, as compared to somebody who was uh, primarily uh, started in say refrigeration uh, it would seem to me it would be easier for you to move from the from the uh, civil and structural and concrete into the area you did in, in the years of development rather than being a refrigeration specialist and then trying to move into the uh, the building construction basis. Oh, that's quite true what you say. Uh, it's interesting to see how many of my generation entered refrigeration from the field of civil engineering. And uh, one very dear friend of mine who is now gone, Arthur Hess, uh, passed
past president. He was also uh, in, in the university in civil engineering and several others that I've known. And um, they go hand in hand. A very good tie-in. And, and uh, an important thing about the civil engineering is the understanding of fluid flow from your hydraulics work. From the hydraulics work, which is very, very necessary to properly handle a refrigeration design or operation. Um, one question I should have asked. When you were uh, involved in the uh, Chilean situation uh, for about 10 years, what time frame was that? That was from uh, starting from about 1967. Through to 67, say to 77? About 77, yes. And you would likely have the experience then of maybe several, well you would have because uh, Allende came to power, didn't he, in 1970? I, I worked through three governments. The work I uh, did was financed by the Inter-American Bank and uh, I was employed by Corfo, the Corporation for, the, uh, the, um, uh, for Production. Uh, for promotion of production in Chile, and I was through three of the governments. So that uh, engineering uh, has to be done and has to be right regardless of whether we're dealing with a left or a right type of government, they have to have you. Well, in this case they did, and and um, the things I was able to do was to teach them a great deal uh, about it. and. This they really appreciated. I certainly was uh, prior to Allende, and I was also a post Allende. And they are remarkably fine people, well educated, and scientifically well based. And I was able to do some things for them. Have they? Uh, uh prospered now in their frozen food industry and uh, so on uh, from the work of those years? Well, uh, that I don't inquire about. No, but I mean like the frozen food industry uh, oh. is well based now then. Well, the, the present time, the big push that you see is on their fresh fruits and such, and vegetables, uh, and flowers. Uh, but they have uh, fruit, which is comparable to that which is grown in California here, and is uh, uh, shipped all over the world. And uh, some of the uh, grape growers in the San Joaquin Valley here are getting a little, and the Central Valley itself, are getting a little interested in these Chilean grapes which are coming in here. They're coming in, yes. I see. And they have to go through all this fumigation for the uh, Mediterranean fruit fly, which California was just worrying about a couple of years ago. That had to be done ten years ago. I see. That's... Um, okay. Now let me uh, carry on. Um, in your... Uh, you mentioned that you've done a lot of legal work. Uh, has this legal work been mainly into the areas of refrigerated warehouses and that sort of thing, or is it pretty wide-ranging? No, my is not wide-ranging. It is uh, directed principally into the fields of uh, heat transfer, uh, insulation, refrigerated warehouses, mm -hmm. controlled environments, and the problems that occur in those uh, fields. They, of course, uh, um, Involve the various disciplines which may be expected to be with them. So we have civil, mechanical, and uh, I also am a member of the Institute of Food Technologists and uh, employ that from my standpoint in many cases. I see. Okay. Um, I'd like to um, uh, catch. Uh, no, I believe, according to your son, uh, Ed Jr., or I guess you're Ted and he's Ed, is that right? Yes, or is he right. called Ed Jr.? We're both Ed, but we're an English family, and they always named the oldest son Edward. And when it got down to him, I did it, and he said, that's enough. He named his boys generally a middle name of Edward. 
but uh, the family went, wanted to be Ted and wanted to be Ed in life, but written down it was Ed. But so he's, he's known as Ed and you're known as Ted. Uh, he told me that you'd done quite a lot of work for the University of California in Davis and in Berkeley in uh, controlled environments. And uh, uh, maybe you'd like to uh, tell me about that, uh, the work and the, the ramifications of it. Yes, I was uh, retained by the University of California, I believe it was back in about 1953, to remedy some of the controlled environmental work which had been done in one of its uh, facilities in Davis, California. And um, we did that successfully. And then we uh, did a lot of other remedial work and then a great deal of crime work and I'm still a consultant to them and have been consultant for all of their campuses. And what sort of controlled environments uh, were they talking about, like for poultry production or? I'll make you any climate that you would like, anywhere, from anywhere, Re like except I can't put the sun in it. <laughs> I see. In other words... Temperature, humidity... Um, air movement? Air movement, um, air purity, any of those. So this has become, I would imagine then, um, one of the main focuses of your consulting practice. It, it is a large part of it. It's a part I enjoy very much because of the fact that uh, it uh, gives me a chance to do some deep thinking and uh, with new problems. And it, of course, also fulfills that uh, wonderful credo uh, that the uh, I guess ASRE and ASHBE, the predecessors, the DASHRE itself of the advancement of the sciences of the arts of heating, ventilating, air conditioning, refrigeration for the good of the public. And uh the, This is very, very important, uh, and it is true. Uh, at the present time, I'm engaged in developing a very specialized uh, controlled environment room for the Division of Architecture for University of California, in which they are going quite beyond anything that had been previously published. So involving not only um, 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 temperatures and hum at a constant condition and so forth, but at pu pull-down conditions at uh, uh, various variable humidity, various temperatures, uh, pull-ups, uh, rapid change, and so forth and so on. And their effect on buildings? Effect on uh, humans. And um, it's quite complex, and um, so I enjoy that, and keep getting a few more gray hairs about it. <laughs> but I've been consulting to the University of California for um, some about 35 years. I'm also a graduate of that campus, so mm -hmm. but I've worked on all the campuses, essentially. I see. Your son also mentioned uh, large animal isolation areas. Oh yes, uh, um, we've done that. That is actually a controlled environment mm -hmm. in which uh, animals were brought in and they're inoculated with a disease and uh, kept in quarantine all the time and they walk in and they're carried out to autopsy as to find what was the cause or what they could do for the treatment, uh, what could be the treatment or what had happened uh, and what the postmortems would show on it. So that animal, large animal isolation was a very specialized construction and of course in that we did not, uh, all of the specialized construction around inside the shell of the building and all the control work and such as that and all the refrigeration, the heating, the air distribution and uh, it was a very particular job. That certainly sounds uh, absorbing. Um, now, uh, would you like to tell me, like you mentioned, you joined ASHPE in 1938 and uh, ASRE in uh, 1939. Um, can you uh, give me any uh, outlines of things, uh, areas you were involved in uh, in ASHRAE? Like I certainly know that 
becoming a presidential member in 1952-53, uh, you were active, uh, you had to be very active in ASHRAE to have moved up through its various uh, levels. Well, I ended through the, although I was a member of uh, ASHVE prior to my entrance into ASRE, uh, I moved up through ASRE as chairman of the San Francisco section, for instance, and uh, uh, then through various offices uh, up to the presidency, which I came into in 52. And um, at the same time, my membership has been longer in V. Uh, actually, when the two, I was, when the two were talking of combining, then I was active in that post uh, my uh, presidential tour. And um, there was great planning on that going on at that particular time. And the actual merger took place, I think it was 57 or something of that nature. But um, then, of course, I was inherited as a grandfather by Ashray. Oh, well, that's, uh, uh, that's their good fortune. Um, Anne has asked a question here. Uh, in the year that you were president of ASRE, um, were there any uh, particular things that uh, you can recall, uh, your particular concerns? Uh, as you know now, each new president coming along, they've got uh, sort of a theme situation. I don't know where that, where that really came from, but is there anything particular from your, uh, that you'd like to talk about in the year you were president? Well, yes. Uh, several of us were particularly concerned about the uh, Constitution, and at that time, uh, as I recall, we were able to make some constructive changes uh, in the Constitution. Uh, and one of the principal things I uh, did was to change the structure of uh, technical committees, uh, to technical uh, technical committees under technical coordinating committees. Uh, that has, of course, been lost sight of probably over the years. But that branch, I see as I look at the uh, plan and the growth tree uh, organization chart, is somewhat retained. And this, uh, we felt, made it much more. Uh, workable than it had been prior to that. Um, and at that particular time I can remember that um, Dan Weil was uh, in charge of the uh, chairman of our technical coordinating committee when I was in uh, the chair. Um, Art Hess and, and Dan Weil, I don't know what whether you knew them well or not, but they were two very fine people. We were West Coasters, you know. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Simon says, I'm not a Western, I'm, I'm a coaster. Yeah, he's a she's, coaster. Fr she's from Ogden, <laughs> she's a Western. We used to, from time to time, have a, a meeting <coughs> together on these various things, and we'd meet halfway between Los Angeles and um, this area. Because you were uh, all West Coasters. Well, it was a convenient at, uh, at um, Paso Robles. We go to the Paso Robles mm -hmm. in there. We got to call it a Brenner Pass. pass. Mm -hmm. But there we had some things which we worked out and thrashed out on what had to be done from this end of the line that we could do, as well as with the other people that we worked with. And uh, the year I was president, I visited essentially all of the sections. I think that year, we were principally running on trains, and I seem to recall there was 40,000 miles I made on the trains that year, which was a pretty stiff jolt at that time, some airplane. But um, I, I felt that some of the things that we had gotten into that groove and the research uh, was spurred because there was one meeting in which it was announced that research is dead and there's nothing you could put do for it. And um, we 
just simply eliminated that idea in RE. That there was, was something, and there must be something, and there must be research. Oh, yes. And we kept that going. Yes, of course. So those are a couple of the things. But then, I mean, that's, that's, the rest of it will have to speak for itself. Surely. Um, well, I remember one thing. I had a very, very interesting trip to Canada. That's the next thing I was going to ask you, because while we all speak the same language, you are speaking to somebody from another country. That's right. <laughs> well, I had the privilege of presenting the charter to the, uh, the British Columbia uh, section up there. Oh, great. They, they, um, what, do you remember what year that was? Oh, of course, it was 52, 52, when you were president, yeah. yes. And Charlie Hamilton was uh, chairman, I believe, up there at that time, or just had been. And um, they were relatively new, and uh, that was uh, quite a high point for me, that because they are such wonderful people, and uh, although I recall something saying going over the border, children of a common tongue, uh, that was true, they'd always... Uh, uh, maybe stick the needle into me a little bit and twist the barb to the place where they then said you're one of us <laughs> and they were just like brothers to me well of course it's it's a wonderful brotherly feeling because oh, yeah. many of us have uh, I have relatives in the states and uh, in fact um, the states is very much better off because of the over the last century the tremendous migration of people from the little country of Canada who came south in order to have greater opportunity, and I suspect that there are uh, there are more Canadian born in the states than there are in Canada. Anyway, right. we'll get off that subject because it may not tie in too well with the historical committee. But nevertheless, that's just between you and me. You sure. cut that out. But there, that was a very wonderful experience I'm when we gave that charter to that. Mm -hmm. You had the charter in, in uh, Toronto at the time, I believe. Yes, I think so. But uh, I uh, don't know. Not, but, not, uh, but not out in Western Canada. The, I believe that uh, ASRE was chartered in, in Canada, in Toronto, in 1936. Uh, ASHVE, uh, I know, was chartered on May 5th, in 1922. But as far as the section is concerned, yes. I don't recall um, another. Uh, I don't recall. I recall your, uh, the Toronto section mm -hmm. and visited there in that year. Mm -hmm. And one thing that impressed me greatly is that uh, uh, every time that we um, had a dinner, a meal, a uh, blessing was asked, and that meant a lot to me. We still do that. Oh, well, it's great. It's great. Well, Canadians, in my opinion, are very wonderful people, and I feel like one of them, when I go there, uh, they treat me that way. Good. I would be distressed to hear anything different from that. Well, Raleigh Locke was a pretty good friend of mine. And yes, uh, yes, I knew him. And um, Did you ever meet Chuck Torrey? He I worked for Raleigh Locke. I don't recall it. I know Raleigh. How about I, Wally Smallwood? I know, I don't recall the name, but I, I may have, but I don't. But uh, Raleigh I met more through ASRE. Mm -hmm. Yes, G. H. Locke and Sons. Yeah. Yes, a very a company that's still going in Toronto. Yeah. Um, I can't at this moment think of anything uh, particular uh, else in the historical concept. Or uh, I'll give you one other little item there. Sure. Uh, anything else that we might uh, have missed? Since uh, for the last twenty-eight years, I have been on the Scientific Advisory uh, Council of the Refrigeration Research Foundation. And um, that again was founded by Dr. Deal, of whom I spoke, and it is a foundation of the uh, International Association of Refrigerated Warehouses. Uh, I have resigned from that, uh, principally because of my fear of conflict uh, of interest if I got into court matters, because this now is beginning to come up this way. And in the court matters, why uh, I create everything, I, I recreate everything as I see it, mm -hmm. and analyze it, and bring it back as to what the true fact was concerning. And I did not want to get into any binds between, and felt that I had been a sufficient time there. So I am, uh, they've asked me to stay on until 
I can attend the last meeting and they can tell me goodbye in March, which I'm going to back for them to do, and I shall enjoy that. But uh, I have been very active in that field of uh, uh, right next to the producer or the, the warehouse man himself. Mm -hmm. And it is, um, I was instrumental in getting a, a research which is now going jointly between ASHRAE and TRRF uh, on infiltration in warehouses, which I feel needs to be done. And it's now under joint uh, research. I see. So um, that has been another activity closely related to and in the refrigeration warehouse field. Well, um, I've really enjoyed this. Uh, according to what I see here on this uh, rundown that John Fox provided, uh, I can see how many of the of the things you've been, been involved in uh, have helped uh, for uh, human welfare, industrial production, environmental conditions, and. Uh, I would say you've had a uh, you've had a wonderfully interesting uh, uh, life of work over the last uh, golly, it's got to be close to sixty years since you started working now, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's been pretty close to that. And um, uh, just to add on to that, a fact that uh, I made the physical paid the physical price in 1936 when I was injured on the collapse of a cooling tower and uh, broken back and I had practically uh, a perfect recovery and uh, for which I thank the good Lord. Yes indeed. And uh, still got the wheels running and... Uh, still got that and climbs Mount 10 periodically. And <laughs> Mountains wherever he's a mountain. So that's, mm -hmm. that's the one thing I've li I lived a very full and uh, practical and interesting life. Yes, I he would say to, so. He wants to climb Mount Whitney. <laughs> well, that's that's it's just not tremendous. The only thing in the state he hasn't climbed. Well, I do want to thank you very much for uh, <coughs> for your time and uh, effort and so on here. It's uh, uh, my first interview is certainly. Uh, First interview was certainly going to be looked upon as a milestone, and uh, especially an a special pleasure having you here, uh, because uh, I think you added um, a lot to it in that uh, you could uh, maybe introduce some little things that I wouldn't have thought of, and which Ted might not have uh, thought of, because after all, uh, who's a more interested observer than a man's wife? Well, that's true. <laughs>